Welcome to the Etsy Conversations podcast, featuring inspiring interviews with Etsy shop owners, hosted by Ijama Elazu. Hi, and welcome to the Etsy Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Ijama, and I thank you for joining me for another episode. This week, my guest is Jess Dollar, and she runs the Etsy shop Pretty Old Books, where she sells vintage decorative books by color. And I'm so excited to talk to her because Jess is doing some very unique things. And as vintage sellers, I think we have so much to learn from what she's doing on Etsy and off of Etsy. So Jess, thank you so much for being my guest and welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Ijama. I'm so excited because I've been listening to your podcast since I started my Etsy shop and it's just a dream for me to be on here talking to you. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm so honored to hear that and, and to hear that you've been part of, of this journey. I I so enjoy talking to people who listen to the podcast because in my head, I still think I only talk to whoever I'm talking to at the time and I don't really envision many people listening. So it's exciting for me to talk to somebody who listens to. Yes, it's been it's been so helpful. Uh, there's so many things I've learned from listening to your podcast, but I totally get that feeling too, because when people email me and tell me that they enjoyed reading my newsletter or something like that, I'm like, oh, people actually are reading that. That's <laughs> nice to know. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> so before we get right into it, can you tell us a bit about you and how you got into selling these old vintage books. Okay. Well, my name is Jessica and um, I live in Nashville, Tennessee uh, with my husband and we have five kids. And I started this Etsy shop back in the spring of 2018 as a way to make some money um, without having to go out and get a full-time job. Um, Cause we had one a uh, preschooler at the time, all of our older uh, other children are older. So we have one preschooler who was starting at, um, uh, a Montessori school. And so I needed to earn a little bit more money for the household. And I decided I was going to try to sell something on Etsy. And I wish I could tell you, I could remember where I got the idea to sell vintage books by color, but I cannot remember. I don't remember where this idea came from. <laughs> and it just, um, I happened to live somewhere, um, where close by, I had a Goodwill outlet. And if you, are you familiar with Goodwill outlet? Yes, I am. Okay. So it's not like the regular Goodwill store. It's where you have to go and dig through the bins and it's, uh, you pay by the pound. Mm -hmm. I happened to have one of those right by my house. And I went one day and they had all of these amazing old books there. So I started buying them and realized that, um, people were selling on Etsy book sets by color. So I started to put some together and threw some up on Etsy and got my first sale six days later, six days, six days later. Yes. I, I, I will never forget where I was when I got that little cha-ching for the first time. I was so excited. I was at breakfast with a friend of mine and we were just leaving and I heard the little cha-ching. I was like, wait, what was that? And then I saw it and I was like, oh my gosh, I got my first sale. I was so excited. And let me tell you, my photography was horrible. I mean, it was so bad, but I made a sale anyway. And you know, you just get better as you go. Yeah. I like that. And, and I, I, I always like it when people just jump in, um, and, you know, whether or not you felt like you were ready, you, you just did it. And I think six days is like almost record time. Well, I don't know. I I, I, I guess I just got lucky. I don't, I don't know. I mean, I was listening to your podcast. So and I was listening, reading everything I could about having a successful Etsy shop. So I did the best I could at the beginning to set it up in a way that I knew, uh, you know, I was filling out all my sections, all my about me and all that mm. stuff. And um, trying to create, you know, useful listings that had all of the details that people would need and put as many pictures as I could in there. And I guess I just happened to have exactly what somebody was looking for that day, exactly. which was a set of old blue books. So. Yes. Now, when when you decided to sell the books by color and you were at the Goodwill, were you able to source enough of an inventory that you you thought you could make enough sets to sell? Yes. And I didn't even have bookshelves at the time. So I was just laying all these books out on my floor and um, doing the best I could. So, you know, I started out with maybe five to no, maybe I started with about 15 listings. Okay. Um, 
And it, you know, when they sold out, they sold out. Now, just recently, for the first time, I created my first evergreen listing. So a listing that ex that doesn't expire when the item sells. So now I'm selling um, individual books by color. And I don't know why I'd resisted doing this for so long, um, but I, I just recently challenged myself to create one listing that can become a bestseller in my shop rather than all of my listings being one of a kind, which is very common for vintage yeah. sellers. All of our listings are one of a kind. But I thought if I create this listing where people can just choose the color and just buy one book at a time, oh. then then um, then that can be a, become a bestseller and it might help with my shop visibility. So I just did that recently, but until recently, what I had was what I had. I, I've had as many as 150 maybe listings in my store at one time wow. and as low as 25. Wow. So, so with your evergreen listing, just to, to make sure I understand, because vintage books, usually you find one, maybe a couple, and then they're gone. But when you sell it by color, it doesn't matter what book. Mm -hmm. A person can just choose, can just say, I want a seafoam green book. And then you can send them any that you have in that color. That's right. Yeah. So okay. I, I just resisted doing this for so long. I, mm -hmm. I don't know why, uh, but I just did it. And um, it's, it's funny because that listing has only been up for about maybe three or four weeks and it's already my most viewed and most, uh, listing for the, for the past really? 30 days. Oh, yeah. that's great. And that makes sense too, because as you know, as vintage sellers, we, um, because most of our listings are one of a kind, we don't get that continuity of life cycle that say a handmade seller or, or someone who sells supplies that are replenishable would, would get. So the Etsy search engine doesn't really get to, um, what's the word? Doesn't really get to figure out how people interact with our listings because it's one and done. Yes. When somebody sees it and they buy it, the Etsy search doesn't have anything else to do with that listing because it's gone. So, um, so yes, creating something like this absolutely, um, is beneficial for you in search because that particular listing, this um, Etsy search can figure out, you know, how people interact with it, how many likes, how many favorites, how many sales result from it. And, and like you said, that will improve your, your, um, where you land in search. Right. Right. And hopefully we'll bring more people into my shop who then might look at my other listings that are one of a kind and yeah. see, Oh, she's already made this red set. This one's fine. I'll get that. Yeah. So yes. yeah, that was my intention. And so far it seems to be working. So mm -hmm. I'm happy about that. Yeah. Cause it really is a challenge for vintage sellers. Mm -hmm. First of all, we have to make listings all the time. I try all to list the time. Yeah, <laughs> I try to list at least one thing a day. Yeah. Um, so it, it can be really hard. And then you you're creating these listings all the time, mm -hmm. but you're not really benefiting from yeah. the the quality store score that Etsy would give like a yes. handmade seller that has an item that they're selling over and over and over yes. again. So that is definitely one of the biggest challenges of being a vintage seller is uh, all the time that goes into creating new listings. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that with Etsy studio, I don't know if you recall or if Etsy studio was around in 2018 or if they ended it prior to that but i think that was part of the problem that etsy was trying to solve for um vintage and supply sellers was that you know trying to create a different type of search algorithm for those because of this type of issue but anyway mm -hmm. they ended up scrapping it because it was not it didn't work yeah i've never even heard of it Oh, well, yeah. you can erase it from your mind because <laughs> Etsy did. <laughs> okay, problem solved. Yes. <laughs> well, I think another one of the issues with vintage sellers is the photography. Um, you know, it, that that is part of the process of creating a good listing, obviously. And yeah. all, of the, all of the advice you see for Etsy sellers is to really work on your photography, which is solid advice. But when you're creating one listing a day, you're not going to have as much time to dedicate to perfecting your photography as somebody who's creating a listing that might last for years. Yes. 
you know, so I, I, I found for myself, I think that's one thing I try to encourage other vintage sellers to do is just find shortcuts for photography and do the best that you can. And uh, you're not going to be going into Lightroom or Photoshop yeah. and, and editing every individual picture. Um, I just use filters. I have a system. I, I use my iPhone for all of my photos. Mm. Uh, I try to use portrait mode whenever I can. If the light is good, I have my one spot where I take photos and and then I have my filter in Visco that I use, and that's that. Do you um do you have a a certain backdrop that you use for all of them? Yes, I do, and I'll tell you what it is. It is two dollar and fifty cent poster board from Hobby Lobby. What? So if you go to Hobby Lobby, they sell designer poster board, and it looks like wood it looks like a wood table or a wood wall so they have two different colors of wood you can get one is a darker wood and one is a lighter wood so my backdrop is that lighter wood and my my table surface is the darker wood and i take every single one of my posters and um, pictures with those poster boards one is taped on the wall and one is on the desk surface that i take my oh, pictures on because i'm looking at them and it looks like you have them like on a hardwood floor against like a book a bookcase or, or a wooden wall. So that's mm-hmm. poster board. That's poster board. That's so fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So I will, for, for anyone listening, I'm going to have all these notes in the, in the show notes for this episode. So, um, well, Hobby Lobby, you just have to go out there. Uh, oh, well, yeah. depending on what's going on at the time you're hearing this, maybe you visit their websites if if we're still on lockdown restrictions yeah i'm sure you can find it on amazon or elsewhere but i just go to my local hobby lobby and it's always there waiting for me and do you tend to use um natural light or do you have a light setup oh i always use natural light. No exceptions, always use natural light. I know what time uh, of day is best for my picture spot. It's afternoon. I get afternoon light in there. Okay. So I have about an hour if the light, uh, if it's a sunny day where I can take photos and it's almost as if the photos take themselves. It's so easy when the light is right to take a good photo. Uh, So if I can get uh, another thing that I really encourage other vintage sellers to do is to really work on batch working. Mm -hmm. So I will make maybe 15 book sets and I will photograph them all at one time. So I'll take all the photos. I will measure the book sets. I will write down all the titles in my notes app on my computer. I will do that in one day or one session. And then the next day or the next time I'm at my computer, I will create all my listings as drafts. And then I will just drip them one at a time yes, to I to Etsy. Yeah. So I, I think vintage sellers have to do that. Yeah. Otherwise, all of your time is going to be um, taken up, eaten up by all these little tasks you have to do every day. So yeah, I'll take yes. a good hour or two of sunlight and get as many book sets photographed as I can in that amount of time. And then the next day I can just sit down for an hour or two and create 15 listings. So as far as time of day for taking the pictures, um, more, more specifically, do you want to avoid the heavy, harsh midday sun or and take it when the sun is setting? Because I've, I've heard that it's better to not take it in, in you know, high bright light, but maybe mm-hmm. when there's some cloud cover. So it acts like a, like those umbrella filters. Yeah, I think it really just depends on the orientation of your home and where the light is coming from. So if I were taking pictures in the backside of my home, I would take pictures in the morning because the light is coming in from those windows. And you can move things around. So it's not getting direct light, but the room is very bright. Um, But the the room that I take my photos in happens to face... um, where the sun is in the afternoon. So uh, if it's, if the sun gets a little bit too low, then the the light is not good because it's shining directly on the books. But Mm. if I can get that window of like three to five o'clock, then it's almost always perfect Perfect. right there where the sun is in the sky. And you just have to experiment. It might be a different time of day for you, depending on where you are in your, in your house. Okay. Now the other concern for vintage sellers is, running out of of sources 
not not just where you go to buy, but also running out of of items to sell. Now, I know there are millions of books in the world, but how do you ensure that you have a constant supply of books? Well, uh, I do have a full bookshelf. So um, sometimes I have too much and that is uh, also a concern. So sometimes I've had to force myself to not shop for a whole entire month to encourage me to work with the inventory I have. And I can find that that really sparks creativity for me. Mm. Um, but the alternative, the opposite of that, especially during the pandemic, is I couldn't go shopping for a couple of months. There were no estate sales I could go to. I couldn't go to the Goodwill outlets uh, around Nashville. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't go to used bookstores. So I had to get creative and start shopping online. So I started sourcing from eBay a lot more and um, Goodwill online and any other place I could find used books for sale. Um, there's, there's just so many options. And I think really what prevents me from having as much inventory as I would like is space and time because it takes a lot of time to source um, and when I first started my shop, I was getting a hundred percent of my inventory from that one good lit Goodwill outlet that I mentioned yeah. near my house. Yeah. And, um, so about six months in, I decided that I needed to learn how to shop at estate sales. I'd never even done it at that point. So I, I challenged myself. I like to challenge myself. I challenged myself for the month of December that year to not go to the Goodwill outlet and to learn how to shop at estate sales. So that's what I did for the month. That month of December, I learned how to shop at estate sales. And then in January, when I went back to my Goodwill outlet, it had closed. What? <laughs> yes, it had, they had oh, closed no. the location because um, they had a rent increase that they couldn't afford. Oh, no. So it is a good thing that I had challenged myself that yeah. month to learn um, how to shop differently because I wouldn't have had a choice. Yes. yes. You know? So yeah, you just have to get creative and, uh, you know, um, Facebook marketplace is starting to become a really, really interesting place to buy things too. You know, I've heard about that and I haven't bought anything yet, but funnily enough, somebody reached out to me who listens to the podcast and sent me an email and said with a listing actually from Facebook marketplace, cause she, she knows what I sell and she goes, somebody's selling this on Facebook marketplace. It's what you sell in your shop. You need to go and buy it from them so you can mm -hmm. resell. I thought that was really nice because yeah. I would never have known otherwise. Yes. I've, I've found two really great sources uh, during the pandemic, especially um, I, I bought this um, professional chef's cookbook collection in Nashville that I found on Facebook marketplace. And that was such a blessing to me because I, I was running out of books at that point. Yeah. And then more recently, I, I found a listing for um, an estate sale and they were doing a pre-sale. So I got to go and shop this estate sale a couple of days early and the books were amazing at this sale. And I, would, I wouldn't have found those if I hadn't been looking on Facebook Marketplace. So speaking of which, when you said you challenged yourself to shop at estate sales and to learn how to shop at estate sales, what does that involve? Can you walk us through how you went about locating estate sales, how you were able to distinguish between which ones were actually estate sales and which ones were more like glorified garage sales? Sure. And picking good ones. Yes. Yes, there is a website, estatesales.net, I believe it is. Mm. So if you get on there, you can search for estate sales uh, in your area. You can set up your search parameters to go up to maybe a hundred or even more miles away from you. Mm -hmm. So I have my my account with estatesales.net. It's totally free. Estate sale companies pay to put their listings on this oh. website. Okay. So what they do is they will create a listing for their estate sale and they will include photos of the things that are going to be for sale. Okay. So I get on estatesales.net and I look through all the sales that are coming up in my area over the next week or two. And I can flip through the pictures and generally tell if there's going to be a lot of books at that estate sale, then I will favorite that sale. And, okay. and estatesales.net will email me and remind me about the sale. And it will also email me if the estate sale company has changed anything about the listing, like the text, or if they've added photos. So that's how I know and how I decide whether an estate sale is worth my time to go to, because you can see from the photos if it's going to have a lot of books oh, uh, nice. or if it's not. Yeah. Oh, nice. Estatesales.net. Great. Yes. Yes. 
Okay, good. I was thinking Craigslist because it's such a minefield yeah. out there. No, no, I do have an I do have an alert set up on Craigslist that anytime somebody posts old books, I get an email. Uh, but that hardly ever pans out for me. But you can do that. You can set up alerts in Craigslist, and they will email you anytime somebody lists something that has your keywords in it. I had no idea you can set up alerts on Craigslist. Yes. Yes. I wish you could do that with Facebook marketplace, but you're not, you can't do that yet. You can't save searches or have get alerts when people list things that you might be interested in. So you just have to remember to go on to Facebook marketplace um, okay. and, and check. Mm -hmm. The Facebook marketplace, um, is it separate from the regular Facebook feed? Like, do you have to go through your feed in order to get to the marketplace? Well, when I look on uh, either either my laptop or my phone and I'm on my Facebook feed, there's a little icon on the top or the bottom of the screen that looks like a little storefront. And then you just click on that and it brings you to Facebook Marketplace. Okay. And there are a lot of people now selling things on Facebook Marketplace that are shippable. So you could get on Facebook Marketplace and create a listing for your product and say that you ship and people all over the country can see that listing if that's what they're searching for, if they're searching for an item okay. like yours. Okay. So that's another way you could sell directly to people rather than using um, Etsy or eBay. Okay. And on Facebook Marketplace, what what guarantees do you have that the person that you're dealing with is legitimate and and is there are there steps to take um what what recourse can you take if if a sale or a transaction doesn't pan out well that's interesting i've not had that happen but it it is helpful that you can see this person's personal profile so you know it's an actual okay. person you can see their facebook profile and um when i sell things on facebook marketplace I give people my PayPal or my Venmo, Venmo, and they have they have to pay for the item. So before I will hold it for them. Mm. So sometimes I will sell like vintage um, prints that I get from books, and I will sell those locally on Facebook Marketplace, and and that's how I do it. Uh, they just pay me through Venmo or PayPal, and then they'll just come to my house and pick it up. And when I've bought things um, from Facebook Marketplace, it's been the same kind of thing. If you want me to hold this for you until you can come pick it up, just Venmo me and I'll hold it. For you. I've, not, I've not had any problems, but I'm sure there's some kind of recourse on Facebook. Okay. And now Facebook, I think, also has its own payment system. So if you're listing something on there, people can pay you through the Facebook uh, payment system. Yes. I, I actually read an article about that about a month ago. Um, so when the pandemic... Um, restrictions were at the height of, you know, the lockdown, um, Facebook quickly retooled their marketplace and integrated a payment system. And the article I read actually was from, I think it was Forbes or Business Insider. And they were saying that um, who they were really trying to go after were Etsy sellers mm. because they were trying to attract Etsy sellers over to Facebook marketplace. And trying to take out barriers for them coming over, like, you know, having to go through PayPal or what have you. So they were integrating it all into Facebook marketplace and giving you the option of creating an actual storefront. So mm -hmm. it looks like an Etsy shop, if you will. And um, you could yeah. actually import listings. There was something they went through about it. And I thought, wow, Facebook is really coming out <laughs> aggressively through the gates. Yes. Yes, they very much changed their Facebook shops and Instagram shop, uh, shopping as well. Uh, I've had clickable Instagram um, Instagram shopping posts for a long time, and I learned how to do that from your podcast way back when I started my shop. One of the first um, one of the podcasts I heard you doing way back then was how to make your your Etsy listings a clickable shopping post on Instagram. And I did that. So I've been doing that forever, but now it's, it seems like they're redoing all of that. So it's going to be much easier to do. Mm. Um, and, and so it seems maybe by the time this airs, things will have settled down, but it seems like things are still kind of iffy and everything is changing. Even the way Shopify is, um, integrating with Facebook shops and Instagram shops is changing a little bit. And I'm hoping that it's actually simpler. So it'll be easier for Etsy shop owners to, to make their posts clickable. 
Yeah, I anticipate that that's the direction they're going. But I really like what you're doing on Instagram. So can we talk about how you're using Instagram stories and your feed to sell your books? Yes, this is something that I just stumbled onto um, relatively early in my um, Instagram and Etsy journey. So I uh, was relatively comfortable being in front of the camera. So as soon as I started my Instagram account that was to uh, support my Etsy store, I was doing Instagram stories of my book hauls. Um, So if I would go to the Goodwill outlet, I'd come home and show everybody on Instagram stories, all the stuff that I got. I love the call videos. I know, they're great. So people started messaging me asking if they could buy the books. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. So I just quickly figured out, okay, I guess I'll just email, invoice you through PayPal. And, you know, when you invoice somebody through PayPal, you get their shipping address automatically. Mm -hmm. And I'm shipping books. So it's really easy for booksellers because we use media mail and the rate doesn't change yeah. no matter how you sell it, uh, send it in the United States. So I can just, you know, I can um, easily know what it's going to tr- cost to ship an item. So I just started selling things from my Instagram stories. So people would see the stories and they would message me and say, can I have this book? And I would give them a price. And so that eventually evolved into me having actual sale events over there in my stories. And if you get onto Instagram, you can use a hashtag like Instabook Finder and find so many little micro businesses, uh, men and women selling books on Instagram. And that's how they do it. They just post, they have set um, sale times mm-hmm. where they will have a sale and they will either do it. Most people do it in their feed. I just always did it in my Instagram stories because mm-hmm. it's easier and I'm all about finding the easiest way to do something. <laughs> Um, so they will have sales and they will post a book and like in my Instagram stories, I would show a book for 15 seconds. I would flip through it and talk a little bit about the book. And if somebody wanted that book, all they had to do was, um, reply to that Instagram story and claim it. And I would, I had my little spreadsheet and I would just type in my spreadsheet, who the person's, what the person's Instagram handle was, what book they wanted and how much it was. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the sale, I would just tally it all up in, uh, and create PayPal invoices and send them to them. And once they paid, I would ship their books. Whoa. And so that quickly became half of my business. It wasn't at all what I intended when I started, but but now the selling individual books that way is at least half of my business. And the other half is selling vintage book sets by color. So how much time does it take to to do your Instagram story sales? Do you dedicate a a specific block of time or do you do it like once a day? And what happens after the the stories disappear after 24 hours? Well, the way that I did it with my stories is I would delete the story as soon as somebody claimed that item. That's why I liked stories. So if if you saw a book in my stories, you would know it was available because I delete them as soon as they're as soon as they're sold. Okay. Uh, but the people that do this, and, and it's not just books, vintage sellers of all kinds are selling their items this way on Instagram. Mm-hmm. So you can find you can find people selling all kinds of vintage goods. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the way they do it in feed, you would have a set time where you announce that you're going to have a sale. And you will say to people, if you want a tag, when I start, start this sale, let me know. So you might create a post and saying, I'm going to have a sale on Wednesday at 6 PM. If you want me to tag you right before the sale starts, leave a comment on this post. So people would leave a comment saying, please tag me. So at the start of the sale, you would have all of your pictures already taken. Mm -hmm. I would create all of my story tiles ahead of time. And when the sale starts, you create the post, you tag everybody that wanted to be tagged. So they get a notification that uh, they've been tagged and they will remember, oh, that sale is starting. I'm going to get over onto Instagram. Mm. And then you either start posting one at a time into your feed, all of your sale posts that you've already created and saved as drafts, or you post them into, like I would post them into my stories one at a time because I've already created them. They're already ready to go. And, and then people start claiming. So they either claim in the feed by just saying me, mine sold, or they would DM you from an Instagram story tile and tell you that they wanted the book. Wow. Yeah. Now, how big of an Instagram following do you need to have to make this work? 
Oh, really not big at all. I think you just have to find your people. And um, a lot of the people that are doing this with books on Instagram are homeschooling moms. Mm. So they're selling uh, vintage books that are out of print that are really popular with certain um, homeschooling communities. Okay. So if you're just searching for hashtags, um, you're going to find these these people doing this. So I, I probably had less than 500 people when I started doing this. And um, I think once you, I think more the problem is getting too large. So that's why I had to really um, slow down on my Instagram story sales because I was, I had too many people mm. and it just became a little bit too chaotic to have a sale and because I'd have to delete the products right away. And um, it, it just got really chaotic. So now I do exactly the same thing, but I do it through my email list, which is even better because those contacts now belong strictly to me. They're not just social media followers that yeah. follow me. So I do the same thing. I create, create a YouTube video where I show everybody all the books that are going to be for sale. I schedule the sale. I put all of the books one at a time into a Google Photos album and I make it a shareable album. And then when I send the link in my email that the sale is live, everybody goes to that Google Photos album and they just leave a comment on a picture if they want that book. And I tally everybody up. I might have like a three day long sale where one, like at this past week, I had a three day long sale where one day was children's books. One day was vintage and antique school books. And one day was just a variety of different things that I had found at estate sales. So after the third day, I invoice all of the books that everybody claimed over the whole entire three days. Mm -hmm. And I create those invoices now in Shopify instead of PayPal. And, mm -hmm. and then I ship everybody's books out. So you can create an invoice in Shopify, even if the sale did, did not go through Shopify? Yes. I, what you do in Shopify is you create a draft. They call their invoicing system drafts. Okay. So you create a draft and then I just create, there's a tab that says create a custom listing. Okay. So I just create a custom listing. I write the title of the book only, no pictures or anything because they've already seen what they're buying. Okay. And then I write the price and then I get the big stack of books that all the books that somebody might have claimed over the past three days, I weigh them on my postal scale. So I know how much they weigh and I can calculate the media mail shipping, add that onto the invoice and send it off. And uh, the reason I switched over to Shopify for my invoicing over PayPal, yeah. even though I love PayPal invoicing, I think it's an excellent product. Um, I decided to create a VIP member program for my, um, my, my best shoppers and also to have a loyalty program so people could earn points when they shop with me, mm -hmm. which is why I switched over to invoicing through Shopify so that people, when they buy from me, even in these email sales, they're going to get points for their purchases because it's going through Shopify. Okay. How are the fees? Are they, are they different or similar to PayPal invoicing? I think you don't pay as many, uh, you don't pay a, as high transaction fees or um, percentage fees on the individual uh, listings. But of course you do have to pay the $29 a month for Shopify. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Jess, you said so much. I'm like, oh, so much <laughs> to dig in. All right. So with your email list, first of all, how do you go about collecting the emails? Um, well, I guess, um, really is, I just invite people to, uh, I, obviously I offer a 25% discount first of all. So if, mm -hmm. if anybody visits my Etsy store or my Shopify site, I try to entice them to sign up mm -hmm. by giving them a 25% discount on their first purchase. So that's one, okay. uh, uh, I, I obviously talk a lot about my sales. I call them secret sales now. Mm -hmm. So I talk about my secret sales a lot on Instagram to encourage people to connect with me through email if they want to participate in those secret sales. And a lot of my Instagram followers are people that have participated in my Instagram sales before. And if they want to continue to shop with me, then they will go and join my email list. And I've also had some, some um, luck doing giveaways and collecting emails through giveaways too. But I generally feel like you're going to get a higher quality uh, subscriber if that person is choosing to join you because they want the discount because they're already interested in buying something from you yes. or if they're following you on social media and you're doing something that they're really interested in that only occurs in email, which is what I'm doing. Yeah. 
Okay, that makes sense. I've, I've done giveaways on Instagram as well. And you're right, you do get, I found that compared to doing a giveaway and just a regular sale through Instagram, it, it, there's a better response from the people who are there because they want to be there, not because they yeah. came because there was something to gain. Yes. And if you you have a really large list, but it's not a high quality list, you're going to be paying more money to, to yeah. have that list through oh, your yes. email service provider. And it might not be worth it. Mm-hmm. I, I go through regularly and clean out my list of people that haven't engaged with me in the last few months. I just remove them from my list because I don't want to pay yeah. to have that person on my list if they're not, they don't seem to be interested in opening my emails or engaging with my shop. Yes. And, and I advise everyone to do that too. I do it too. I'll go in and I will either, I'll do it two ways. I'll either remove everyone who hasn't engaged in the last six months or who hasn't opened the last three emails I've sent. I take Mm -hmm. them off because it costs too much money to carry people who aren't really paying attention to you. Yes, absolutely. And I I know everybody wants their list numbers to be really high, but it's and it's the same with Instagram. It doesn't matter how many followers you have. It matters how engaged they are with you. And that's why I think it's so important for our faces to be out there. My business is my business because of me. People can buy books from anybody. They're buying books from me because they know me. Yeah. because I engage with them. I show them my face. I talk to them on, on Instagram stories. I talk to them on YouTube and, and that's why they are supporting me because they know me and they know who is running the shop. It's just me. Okay. What um, email provider do you use? Uh, I started out using MailChimp mm-hmm. and uh, when I switched over to Shopify, it was one of those cascading Oh, now I have to change this. Now I have to change that. Uh, at the time, I don't know if this is still the case, but at the time, MailChimp had just stopped um, working seamlessly with Shopify. You couldn't get a Shopify. App. Shopify is all about the apps. So if you can't, ha- if you don't have an app that's going to easily integrate into your Shopify store, you're going to have some complications. Mm-hmm. So at that point, I decided to switch over to Clavio, uh, which is really, really popular with Shopify sellers, okay. and uh, Clavio has been really good. I, I think it's good for Shopify store owners. Okay. And um, but if if you're more interested in engaging, like bloggers and stuff, they wouldn't use Clavio. It's not it's not meant for bloggers. It's meant for Shopify store owners that are selling actual products. Oh. And, and that's how the, that's what they're geared towards. That's how their segmenting works. That's all the all the tools they build. Are, are meant for Shopify store owners. So MailChimp, MailChimp is great. I mean, it's, 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 and there's some things you can do in MailChimp that I can't do in Clavio, like create landing pages and things like that. So I have considered separating my list into two, like having one list that's just um, dedicated to my Shopify store and another list that's more general interest in all the different things that I do in pretty old books, which is sell on Etsy the decorative books by color, but also the individual books. Okay. Um, but if you have a Shopify store, I think Clavio is the way to go. Okay. Good to know. I've heard the name, but I didn't know that they were very um, specifically targeted at e-commerce. Well, specifically yeah. Shopify sellers. Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned that you will make a YouTube video and that you also communicate with your audience on YouTube. How much time um, do you spend on YouTube? What's your strategy there? Uh, well, I use YouTube only as a means to an end. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't have many followers over there. It's just people. I send people over there so they can see the books before they buy them. So that has always been the most important thing to me and what has made me stand out from other um even Instagram sellers um, that I'm comfortable with video. So I want people to see me flipping through the book. I'm going to show them the front and the back and talk about the book. And so they know exactly what they're getting. Cause these are vintage and antique books. They're never perfect. Yeah. And I want people to be absolutely uh, sure about what condition the book is in before they choose to buy it. Yeah. So I used to be able to do that very easily through Instagram stories, but once I kind of outgrew that, 
-hmm. I had to find another way to do those videos. So I just threw them up on YouTube. So I don't, I don't worry about my production values or anything like that. I just sit on my floor or I sit in my bedroom, wherever the books happen to be. I might just even be sitting at my kitchen table and pulling the books out of the bag as I look at them after an estate sale, like, Hey, let's just look and see what I got. And so it's not fancy, but it allows people to see what they are shopping for. Nice. And do you do all the recording on your phone? Yes, I use my phone. I have a iPhone NS and that's what I use to do everything. I like how you just keep it simple because that keeps you moving. Yes, I, you know... One of the mistakes I've made over and over and over again is making things more complicated Mm -hmm. because in the name of growth, Mm -hmm. and I've, I've really, (laughs) I've really got to learn how to not do this because it causes a lot of problems. Like I, I opened my Shopify store because, well, I want to grow. I want to start doing Shopify, Mm -hmm. but that just created another layer of complication, another layer of tasks. I do use the, um, Etsify, Um, to talk between my Etsy store and my Shopify store. And that was a one-time purchase. So I paid $69 for that one time. And now every time, but the problem is it doesn't automatically sync. You have to manually sync things. So every time now I sell something on Etsy, I have to immediately remind myself to go and delete that product from Shopify and the other way around. So I just created this level of bureaucracy for myself in the name of growth, in the name of moving over to Shopify. Yeah, And I, did, I just did it to myself again when I started my loyalty points program and my VIP program in the name of growth. I wanted to do this and also to reward my customers that shop with me over and over and over again. So my heart was in the right place, yeah. but you don't realize sometimes what these levels of complication are going to look like in your day-to-day work cycle. Yeah. It just might not be worth it. And I've always believed that the simplest, easiest way to do something is the best way because you're going to be able to keep your costs down. You're going to be more motivated to do things. And that's why I was selling books and Instagram stories because it was so easy. So easy. Yeah. Now, do you sell internationally? I do. I ship uh, books all over the place. Um, I've shipped to uh, so many countries now I can't even count. Um, every time somebody orders books from me that are shipped internationally, I don't understand why they are doing this because it costs so much money. I will give you an example. Back in the spring, I sold, oh, it must have been four boxes of books to somebody in um, the United Arab Emirates. Whoa. And this person paid $400 oh. just for shipping. Just for shipping? for shipping. Yes. It's very expensive because books are heavy yeah. in the United States. I am so grateful that I have the U S postal service that has the media mail rates. So I, yeah. it's very affordable to ship books throughout the United States, but it's very expensive to ship internationally because they're heavy, hmm. but people do it. I, I don't have a lot, but probably at least like one a month to, you never know where to yeah. France, Australia, to, um, Germany, everywhere. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I, I know I, sometimes I feel bad when I, when I make an international sale, I'm happy to do it, of course. Yeah. But when I see the shipping, I think, oh man, are you sure you really want this? Because <laughs> not that right. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, I hope they're happy when they get it. Because <laughs> Yes. Yes. I, I, I don't understand that either. And I just assume, you know, I had one buyer for a while in Singapore who um, wanted only navy blue books. And this buyer came back to me three or four times and wanted like 50 navy blue antique and vintage books. Custom order. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And and so I I did what I can I could to to find all of those books. That was definitely a challenge to find Mm -hmm. that many books in that color in a short period of time. But I made it happen. And shipping internationally is no harder than shipping in the United States. You just have to have, you know, the custom sleeves sometimes, which you just, if you don't have custom sleeves in your house, you just get them from the post office. When you drop your books off, you just tell them I have, I need a custom sleeve. And it's just a big sticker envelope that they stick on the box. So you can slip the three custom sleeves that, um, that have the address and all the customs information on it. Oh, right. Yes. Okay. Okay. I know what you mean. So it's, it's no, it's really no harder than shipping internet uh, locally or in the United States. 
Now, with the books, do people, are people specific or, or particular, I should say, about sizes um, when they have a special request or if you have a set? Do you try and keep the sizes all uniform? I, may, I, I definitely make um, all different kinds of sizes. Mm -hmm. And I include in every listing what the size of the book set is. Okay. So I, I used to get a lot of uh, questions what is the size of this set? So yeah. it occurred to me, I should tell people what the size of the set is. So now I do that for every book set. I include the dimensions because yeah. people do have different size bookshelves or they yeah. need things for certain places. Mm -hmm. um, but I just generally make what I want and I make, I make what I want and I make from what I have. So if I just happen to have like five beautiful green coffee table books, then I'm going to make a green coffee table book set. And that that's what I've got. And I generally try not to take custom orders because it just takes too much time and it's not really worth it. It's not worth the effort. Yeah. Um, but people will message me sometimes anyway and ask if I could do this with this set or that with that set. And I do try to do my best if somebody messages me and, and asks, um, I'll, I'll try to help them out. Okay. Um, but in general, I think I have, I, I usually have custom orders turned off in my shop because it's just okay. not worth the time yeah. and the back, it's the back and forth. That's the trouble. You know, it just yeah. takes up days. So now how do you figure out how much to charge for a particular set? Oh, well, when I started out, I just looked around at the other Etsy sellers that were selling the same thing as me. And that's where I started. And I offer free shipping, which is very easy for me to do. Like I said, because media ma mail yeah. rates don't change depending on what um, part of the country you're sending it to. So yeah, it's very sure. easy for me to build in my cost of shipping. Okay. Um, so over time, I have bumped up my prices um, because I'm a more experienced seller now. And, um, and also because Etsy is charging more for Etsy ads and all those things, you just have to build in a little bit of a buffer now. Mm -hmm. Um, now that I could be getting a 15% hit if that, if that item happens to sell from an Etsy, uh, offsite ad. Yeah. So yeah, I've just bumped up my prices little by little. I compare myself to where I am with other sellers that are selling the same thing as me. Yeah. And I try to keep right in line with them. I don't want to be the bottom. I don't want to be the top. I just want to be kind of right there in the middle. And that seems to work really well for me. And sometimes I'm lucky and um, I might see, okay, every time I sell a set like this, it sells really fast. So I'm just going to go ahead and list it for a couple dollars more this time and see what happens. Yeah. So um, you know, there's, there's certain colors, there's certain textures of books that just are, people really like them and they'll sell really fast. So if that's the case, I might slowly bump up the price of that book set to the point where I feel like, okay, well, maybe this is a little bit too high. Okay. So what does a typical day running your business look like? How do you divide your time between what you're doing on social media orders coming in from Etsy and all the Etsy admin that go along with that, as well as just everything. It is a lot. Yeah. It is a lot. <laughs> and uh, I am very resistant to routines. I cannot use a planner to save my life. <laughs> I I'm just not that type of person. So what works best for me is to have a rough idea of the types of batch work I can do and batch my, my stuff. So if I'm having an email book sale one week, I'm going to focus mostly on that because it takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. And, and then I try to only do those like every other week. So one week I'm focusing more on the selling of the individual books in my email. Another week I might be focused on my Etsy shop okay. and, and my tailwind queue. So I use tailwind to plan out all my Instagram posts. So okay. I, I will create all my listings in a batch and then I will pick as I'm doing this, I will pick my best photo from that listing. The one that I think is going to look the best on Instagram. I will throw that into, um, I use a different app for filters for my Instagram photos. I use a color story and I have a go-to filter on there that I use for all my Instagram posts. So I will go ahead and edit that one photo and then send it to tailwind. So when I'm done batching all of my listings, let's say I've made 15 listings in a, in a batch of like two hours of work. The next day I might spend that two hour batch creating all my 
captions for my Instagram and planning out my Instagram for the week, depending on what's going to be going live in my Etsy shop. Okay. And I, I found that is the best way to manage all the little bits and pieces of all the different things that need to be done is to just batch work. If I, if I get away from batch work and I'm trying to do all those little things every single day, a little bit at a time, I, yeah. I just get so frazzled and yeah. so stressed out. It's just, you really just got to dedicate yourself to batching. So one day you're doing photos and the next day you're doing listings. The next day you're doing tailwind and Instagram and the next day you're doing YouTube and the next day you're doing preparing for your next email sale and throwing everything in Google photos albums yeah. to the best of my ability. That's how I stay on top of things. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine there is so much going on and just imagining how you keep everything going. It sounds, it sounds like a lot and that you would need to have a system in place. How do you make sure things don't fall through the cracks? Oh, they fall through the cracks. They do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the nature of it. Um, you know, sometimes I will go a week where I don't message my in my Etsy shoppers to say thank you for your purchase. I try to et to message my Etsy shoppers when they buy something from me. Uh, when I ship the item, because I ship every day. So when I ship the item is when I will send them the thank you. I've shipped your item. You can track it in your order history. And I just want to say thank you. And then I try to message them when I see that their item has been delivered. And then I message them if they leave me a review. That is the type of thing that falls through the cracks, those little things. Or my Instagram feed. I might not post for like five days on Instagram because that falls through the cracks. Yeah. So and, until I get to the point where I feel comfortable hiring a virtual assistant, these little things are going to fall through the cracks. Yeah. And I, I just try to remember that I'm only one person and I have my most important tasks. So if I stay on top of those, the, the other things, it's okay if it takes me a week to message that person. As long yeah. as I've messaged them at some point and said, thank you. Yeah. You know, I just try to remember I'm only one person and I can only do what I can do and look for ways to simplify. You know, I like to ask who the, my guests that I'm having a conversation with what advice they would give to someone else. I think you just did it. Yeah. <laughs> you just gave it because I know a lot of us are one person shows and and some of us do come down hard on ourselves when things fall through the cracks and, yeah. and, and we miss things or we forget things. So we have good intentions to reach out to, yes. you know, to, you know, take our customer service, you know, up one level and, you know, you're one person, you forget, you fall asleep yeah. and you remember, yeah. oh my goodness, I was supposed to say thank you. Yes. <laughs> and and you know, I, I make mistakes all the time and I just try to apologize if I make a mistake um, you know, cause I am one person and I, especially when I'm doing an email sale, I might forget to put somebody's, I might forget to include a book and an invoice or yeah. little things like that. And you just apologize and move on and just understand that these people know, they, they know me, they, as long as they get an apology from me, yeah. it's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. And if I was to give advice to somebody that was just starting out on Etsy, especially selling vintage, mm -hmm. I would say. The most important things are focus on the quality of your listings and focus on your Instagram because vintage sellers have to bring their own traffic to Etsy. Yeah. It, it, it's, that's just the way it is. We have to bring our own traffic. I bring probably 60% of my traffic mm -hmm. um, to my Etsy shop. And that's even now my shoppable inst Instagram posts link to my Shopify site, but some people just still feel better I think shopping on Etsy. So they will take the extra step of going to my profile, clicking on a link then clicking on my Etsy store and buying from me there mm -hmm. instead of my Shopify. So, but, and I'm, so I'm still bringing the majority of my traffic to Etsy. So I think keep it simple, focus on your listings on Etsy and focus on your Instagram and ask yourself before you were doing something in the name of growth, if this is just going to add more complication, if, and if it's really necessary. Yeah. I think that's a really important to, um, question to ask yourself because like you said earlier, and I can 100% relate to thinking about doing something and in the, in the name of growth and, and going for it and afterwards realizing just how much more complicated I had made 
my life and yes. I had made things. And yes. instead of growing, I actually ended up slowing down a bit, which, you know, sometimes turned into regression. And so, um, yeah, it's, yeah, I agree yeah. with you there. I mean, really in hindsight, I don't even know if I should have opened that Shopify store and I, I, I'm glad I did because it's always best to have your own platform, mm -hmm. but it seems a great plat platform. I love it. You know, of course they are always changing things and it really frustrates people, but I love Etsy. I think it's an amazing platform. They're bringing all of these people to this site that are interested in buying things from individual people and are not primarily motivated by price. That's yes. an amazing thing. Yeah. That's an amazing. Thing. Yes. So, so Jess, you opened pretty old books to help pay for your little one's school. <laughs> now, where do you see, where do you see pretty old books going in the future? What are your hopes for it to look like, say, five years down the road? Oh, gosh, five years. That's so far away. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm focusing right now on growing my VIP membership. Uh, so this was something I was really interested in challenging myself to do. Um, it made me really uncomfortable to ask people to pay me a flat fee every month to get access to certain things. So I knew I had to do it because it made me so uncomfortable. Mm. So I just launched that and I'm, I'm working on... Um, all the different ways that I can serve those VIP customers better. So having earlier access to books and I've just started a new newsletter that um, is just focused on, Hey, I found all of these vintage books around the internet and I'm not going to buy them, but you might like them. So here, here's a link to all these different books around the internet. So I'm, I just started that. Um, and also I think one direction I'm definitely going in is helping other vintage uh, and book sellers learn how to do this for themselves, especially now in this crazy time that we're going through yeah. where people um, are looking for ways to make some money from home. Mm -hmm. So I have another Instagram account called bookshop school, which is focused more on just uh, the business side of talking business, talking shop, uh, teaching people how to sell books on Instagram and teaching people how to sell vintage and books on Etsy and other platforms from home. So I think that I would like to focus more on that in the future and, um, and also the VIP program it, and focusing my efforts on how to um, have a core group of buyers that are supporting my shop every single month mm -hmm. that I can, I can, uh, continue to serve better. And that making that, that is something that would make my life easier. And if my life is easier, then I can offer more to my people. Yeah. I like that. We'll see. You do have a plan for the next five years. <laughs> well, I think well, that's what I want to do in the next five months, but perhaps that's a little unrealistic. <laughs> yes. Well, take your time because I, I do think that it's, you've you've created systems and and ways of of selling that work for you that i think are replicable yes. i hope that's a word i think it is okay yes. <laughs> and and i i'm grateful that you're sharing that because a lot of the resources when it comes to selling on etsy um even though they are like we said i, I think before we started recording they are they are um, applicable across all types of sellers, but there are some things that are just so unique to vintage sellers or people who sell one of a kind items where we need to do things a little bit differently. And I think you've just done a phenomenal job of figuring out different ways of doing things that work that aren't necessarily so complicated. I mean, yes, maybe, you know, maybe, you know, you, you've, grown into other things but you know at the core you found you found ways of doing things that worked and were easy and and ended you know achieved the goal of making sales and making people happy and I think it would be great when you can share that even more with the world and other other sellers who are aspiring to do the same thing so I hope that all works out 
Oh, thank you. I mean, I love talking shop. I, I love talking about selling books and selling vintage. So I will never get tired of that. And I, I do think there are um, so many ways to do things. And just my personality type, I don't like to do things the way that other people do them. Yeah. I'm, I'm always looking for a different way. So, uh, and when I find ways that work, I do want to share it with other people. Yes. Now, Jess, if anyone wants to connect with you, if they have more questions or, or they just want to carry on this conversation with you, what's the best way they can do that? Well, you can email me at jess at prettyoldbooks.com or you can find me on Instagram at Pretty Old Books or Bookshop School on Instagram as well. Fantastic. So I will have links to everywhere you can find Jess so that you can connect with her and um, go check out her Etsy shop and her website, which is her Etsy shop is Pretty Old Books and her website is prettyoldbooks.com. I like that. It's so simple and easy to remember. Thank you. And um, just thanks again so much for being my guest. I really enjoyed this conversation. And I think you're going to do even more than what you're doing now. So can we talk again when when you've added to your arsenal of knowledge and, and systems of doing things? I would love that. And I want to thank you so much for having me on. I, I'm just so grateful. I am too. Thank you, Jess. And I thank you for listening to the podcast. If you want to connect with me, um, you can find me at convome.com. There's a contact page there. Um, I invite you to be my guest on the podcast as well. And if you just want to connect on social media right now, I think Instagram is probably the best place to find me at convome podcast. Thank you for listening to this week's episode and I will be back next week. Thank you for listening. You can subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, and while you're there, please leave a review, too. Visit ConvoMe.com to leave a comment or feedback on this episode.